Okay, welcome everyone. I hope you're all doing very well. This is our 101th webinar and we're going to have an SBA quiz on medicine. Um, so I'm sure quite a few of you tuned into Azeem's quiz on, uh, I think it was Monday, um, which covered the surgical questions. Today we're going to go over some SBAs in medicine. Uh, there is a prize up for grabs uh, and it's a monetary prize, so um, make sure you stay tuned till the end. To go through what we'll be covering, it will be, as I said, a quiz on medicine covering broadly the main specialties you're in, you'll encounter in your exams. And um, initially we were aiming for a fair few questions, but for the purposes of time, uh, I've limited the quiz to 19 questions and you have 40 seconds per question. So we'll go through, we'll do a question, we'll have explanations after, and then we'll move on to the next question. You have 40 seconds per question, but for the final two questions, the faster you answer, the more points you will get. And I'll remind you of that when those questions pop up. But for the last two questions, the quicker you answer, the more points you score. And all of these questions are derived from our previous webinars and our textbook. So if you have tuned in before, or if you've had a look at our textbook, hopefully that puts you in good stead. Um, as always, the recordings will be on app.biomedicine.com. And if you have any questions throughout, just drop them in the chat or in the Q&A function. Very good. And this is what is up for grabs. So there is a £50 prize for first place, plus a one-year premium access to the Bite Medicine platform, a national prize certificate, and probably the most important prize is the Bite Medicine mug. And then you get £25 for second place and £15 for third place. Just some logistics. So this quiz will take place on Menti. When you register on Menti, put in your full name or as much as, as much of your name as you can fit. And at the end, if you're ranked within the top three, please do take a picture or a screenshot of the leaderboard and email that to us at admin at bitemedicine.com because that's how we'll know if you came in the top three or not. So make sure if you come in the top three to take a picture or a screenshot of the leaderboard at the end. Before we crack on with the quiz, remember we have our question bank, our online textbook and our live webinars. And this is an ever growing bank of content. We're always updating it with new guidelines and actually some of the latest guidelines will feature in this quiz. Um, so without giving any hints away, um, if you, if you brushed up with the latest guidelines, you know, that will put you in good stead, but please do check out the rest of our content. Our question banks, a case-based question bank. So it takes you through from first steps to pathology, right through a particular diagnosis. And I'm sure loads of you have seen our textbook, which again is fairly comprehensive. Um, last little reminder, so today this is me, SBAs in Medicine, we have some derm stuff coming up um, and we have our course, our crash course in September on medicine and surgery, which me and Azim will be doing. But okay, without further ado, let's crack on. Hopefully this works. If you all head over to menti.com and you pop in the code at the top, 4082399. If you have any questions throughout the quiz, just drop them in the chat or the QA. And um, yeah, best of luck. May the best man or woman win. I'll just give you another 30 seconds to sign in. So for those of you who just joined us, it's menti.com. Code at the top is 4082399. Okay, let's get started.
Okay, question one, almost done. By the way, some of these questions are straightforward and some of them are really difficult. So, yes, this is one of the more difficult questions. Don't worry if you find these questions hard. I purposely made some of them hard to test you. Um, okay, what do we have here? 50 year old man with chest pain. Why is it not PCI? He's got a STEMI. Why is the answer not PCI? Any takers? Yes, very good. Very good, Ryan. It's greater than 12 hours onset. The, the chest pain started 14 hours ago. There are two in, well, three indications for STEMI. Oh, sorry, three indications for PCI. The patient has a STEMI. It's available within two hours, and the chest pain should have started less than 12 hours ago. If you meet all three of those criteria, PCI, you're all good to go. If any of those criteria fail, the patient goes for thrombolysis, also known as fibrinolysis, the same thing, which will be with alteplase or a fibrinolytic agent. Um, so I think most of you are split between PCI and alteplase, but the answer is alteplase for that reason. Um, as you guys in the chat have rightly said, well done. Don't worry, it's a bit of a tricky one to start off with. Um, so don't worry if you, if you struggle on that one. But basically here's the pathway. I've covered ACS in one of my webinars a while back, but if you have a STEMI, give them some high dose aspirin, then figure out, as I said, did the chest pain start within 12 hours and is PCI available in two hours? If so, we're all good to go to have PCI. If not, it's fibrinolysis or thrombolysis, two words for, for the same thing. Um, yeah, so that's that was the, the, the little trick in that question. So Naveed asked a question about alteplase stroke and the time limit. So yeah, it's a different time limit. In um, stroke, you have that four and a half hour cutoff. It's not the same for ACS. Okie dokie, next question. Is that working? No, sorry. I think this is actually quite a difficult question. Okay, good. So we have an, a 65 year old with heart failure who needs a CRT fitted. For those of you who don't know what CRT is, it's cardiac resynchronization therapy. To put it in a nutshell to understand this, in heart failure, your heart is inefficient. It's not pumping as well as it should. Cardiac resynchronization therapy is a little device that you put in the chest and it makes both ventricles contract in synchrony, okay? Hence, resynchronization therapy. By getting both ventricles to contract together at the same time in synchrony, you increase the efficiency of the heart and therefore help with, that's, that's why it's helpful in heart failure. So now you need to think, when will CRT be useful? Well, it's useful when the ventricles aren't contracting in synchrony. And that is determined by what? How do you know if the ventricles aren't contracting in synchrony? What, what will be the features that you'll see on investigation? So firstly, if the ventricles aren't contracting in synchrony, the heart is inefficient. So the most basic thing will be that the left ventricular ejection fraction will be down. Okay, the heart's not pumping properly. The ejection fraction is going to be down. And as 
some of you have rightly said, the QRS time will be prolonged, okay? I'm not gonna go into why that is uh, because it will just be a bit time consuming, but just take my word for it. And I've done a webinar on ECGs and why that's the case. Um, and the third thing is left bundle branch block. So indications for a CRT are reduced left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 35%, a long, a prolonged QRS complex time of over 120 milliseconds in general, and left bundle branch block. Good. Next question. So well done, most of you got that right. Was a, that was quite a tricky one, I'd say. So just to be clear, it's 147 millimoles per liter and 3.3 millimoles per liter, if that wasn't clear. Very good, okay, so that was, this question is looking at refractory hypertension. It's unusual to be this hypertensive in a 45 year old. He's on three antihypertensive agents. His blood pressure is still high. Um, he's got hypernatremia and hypokalemia. The upper limit of normal for sodium is 145 and the lower limit of normal for potassium is 3.5. So he's got hypernatremia and hypokalemia. Therefore, the answer is he's got too much aldosterone. Aldosterone causes sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion, hence the hypernatremia and the hypokalemia. Because you're reabsorbing a lot of sodium, water follows sodium, hence patient's blood pressure goes up and it becomes difficult to treat. And that's what's going on in this gentleman. Um, bonus points. Well, this won't really count towards the quiz, but what's the most common cause of primary hyperaldosteronism? Are you sure it's hyperplasia or is it adenoma? We've got takers for hyperplasia. Good, yeah, it's uh, adrenal gland hyperplasia. Very good, very good. Um, well done. Next question. Okay, so I personally, um, I hate all questions to do with diabetes because I can never remember what the targets are and what the drugs do and what their side effects are. But unfortunately, exams like to test them. So I put in a question here. Why is it reinforced lifestyle measures? When do we step up to dual therapy? When do we step up to two anti-diabetic agents in type two diabetes? So the target is 48, but you step up at 58, okay? The target is 48, but as you guys have rightly said, you step up at 58, 
and I'll show you what that actually means. Because I, another thing I never really understood at medical school is what the difference was between a target and a stepping up, because it doesn't, isn't that the same thing? Um, but here is the little flow chart. So diagnosis of, of diabetes happens when your HbA1c is greater than or equal to 48. So that's a diagnosis. Okay, you can try lifestyle measures. And with lifestyle measures, you try and keep the HbA1c at 48 or less. If you're trying lifestyle measures, the patient's dieting and exercising, but the HbA1c goes above 48, you throw in some metformin. Now, this is the, the point that I want to highlight. The target for metformin is 48. So ideally, with patients on metformin, you want them. You want their HbA1c to be in and around 48 millimoles per mole. But there's some leeway. So you don't step up therapy at 48. You step up at 58. So you give them metformin. You reinforce lifestyle measures. If their HbA1c goes above 58, then you add in a second agent. Okay. And then so on and so, so forth. This, um, this flow chart is fairly straightforward. This is taken straight from our textbook, so you can go and check that out. Um, but essentially, the next stage, you step up therapy again if the HbA1c goes above 58, but the target is actually 53. So ideally, you, wanna, you want the HbA1c to be in and around 53, but once it goes above 58, you move on to the next stage, and so on. So make sure you know those numbers because no doubt you will get tested on them in your exams. Well done for those who got it right. It was a tricky question. Oh yeah, this, this one's quite tricky actually. There are some easier questions coming as well. Hmm. This is a difficult question, to be fair. Um, I purposely put this question in because it's a really good learning point. So for those of you who uh, like to read the, you know, like to keep up to date with the, the latest guidelines and have happened to have read the Joint uh, British Diabetes Association guidelines, which came out in, I think, April 2021, the management of diabetes, or DKA rather, has been updated and the guidance now says so before to treat dka you know it's really straightforward you give some fluids it's a particular fluid regime you give them saline and you add in some potassium later on and then you start a fixed rate insulin infusion at 0.1 units per kilo per hour when your glucose drops below 14 you start a glucose infusion at 10 percent glucose so that's why it's not 50%, it's not 20%, it's 10% glucose. The most recent guidelines say, as well as doing that, you should consider dropping the rate of insulin infusion to 0.05 units per kilo per hour. The reason I put this in is because it's an updated guideline and you should know it for your exams. Um, I know we have some international people here. This, these are the British guidelines, so it might not necessarily apply worldwide. Um, so I apologize for that, but it's a really important one to know that when the glucose drops below 14, you should consider dropping the rate of insulin infusion. Okay, so again, it's 10% glucose. Um, and that's essentially the answer. So that was a tricky one. And I purposely put some, some questions in there to challenge you.
This is another tricky one. Oh, okay, very good. Well done. You guys have been keeping up to date with the most recent uh, anaphylaxis guidelines. So again, this is really important because actually this will affect you in real life and that you will see patients with anaphylaxis when you are doctors or physician associates or paramedics or you know whatever you might be, you, inevitably you will encounter a patient with anaphylaxis. And this is life-saving okay so it's, you need to know the management of anaphylaxis inside out um, because you need to act quickly and what you do could potentially save the patient's life uh, the first obviously is a b c d e approach but adrenaline is the key in anaphylaxis the resus council have updated their guidelines to say we no longer use steroids and antihistamines in the emergency setting, okay? It's all dependent on adrenaline, fluids, oxygen, maintaining the airway, putting them in a sitting position, okay? Because that helps with breathing. That's all essential. You don't need to give hydrocortisone in the emergency setting. That's, uh, so that's essentially the answers written out, but this is the guideline, okay? So A, B, C, D, E, Obviously, call for help, do all of that, but give adrenaline, that's absolutely key. Protect the airway, oxygen, give fluids, give adrenaline every five minutes as required. Um, and that's essentially the, the main points of anaphylaxis management. So Let me just read out the guidelines here. It says the routine use of corticosteroids to treat anaphylaxis is not advised. Consider giving steroids after initial resuscitation for refractory reactions or ongoing asthma or shock. Steroids must not be given preferentially to adrenaline. Antihistamines are not recommended as part of the initial emergency treatment for anaphylaxis. Uh, antihistamines have no role in treating respiratory or cardiovascular symptoms of anaphylaxis. Okay, so they're pretty clear in their guidelines. Um, and someone's asked, why don't we give hydrocortisone anymore? Uh, probably because of how useful it is in the emergency setting. It takes some time to work. Uh, it doesn't necessarily reverse the airway, breathing, or circulation problems immediately, unlike adrenaline, which, you know, that's the most important thing that will terminate the anaphylactic reaction. Fluids will help um, with the circulation, whereas hydrocortisone doesn't necessarily have those immediate effects. That's, that's why I personally think they've changed the guidelines. And actually the role of steroids in the emergency treatment of anaphylaxis, as well as antihistamines has been debated. Um, okay. Doing very well. Good. So according to the Endocrine Society, the first line management of what's the diagnosis here? Good. So it's acromegaly. Okay. The, the patient has an excess of growth hormone causing prominent facial features and spade-like hands. Of course, you get tons of other features as well, like they'll be hypertensive. You may have headaches. Um, you may have carpal tunnel syndrome. The first line investigation in Acromegaly, according to the Endocrine Society, is IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, which will be raised. 
If you find the IGF-1 is raised, the next thing you do is an oral glucose tolerance test. Normally when you give patients glucose, um, their growth hormone goes down. When you have too much growth hormone in acromegaly, the growth hormone remains raised. Um, and then the final thing you'll do is a pituitary MRI. So that's not first line, pituitary MRI is kind of like the last investigation you do, because um, then you can see the adenoma. Um, so yeah, that's it. First line according to the endocrine society and should be elevated insulin like growth factor one. Good. Again, this is a really important one for you to know for your uh, clinical practice, but yeah, you've all nailed it. It's, um, or most of you've nailed it. It's a uh, saturation of less than 92%. So peak flow of less than 33% is life-threatening. Above that, so uh, I think it's 33 to 50% is severe. Um, heart rate of at least 110 or more is considered severe. A respirator of 25 or more is considered severe. Inability to complete sentences in one breath is severe. Rather altered consciousness, respiratory exhaustion, and respiratory exhaustion, those are considered life-threatening. Re respiratory, um, sorry, saturations of less than 92%, that's a life-threatening feature. Good, next question. So we're halfway there now, you're all doing very well. Don't worry if you're finding some of these difficult. Okay, so I had to put a radiology question in there because I'm a radiologist, uh, and that is interstitial lung disease, fibrotic lung disease. Um, well done. Let's have a look. I think I've got the image on the PowerPoint. So yeah, this is classic of uh, interstitial lung disease. What's the diagnosis here? just looking at this um, just looking at this slice of the CT scan can you know what the diagnosis is so yeah, interstitial lung disease pulmonary fibrosis is kind of the same thing but do we know what the cause is so we got COVID? no it could be the point is we don't know uh, so it's a trick question. Uh, radi radiologically, you can say this is um, interstitial lung disease. You can give the pattern. There's different types of uh, interstitial lung disease which you might, might have come across, uh, like usual interstitial pneumonia. Uh, but basically, um, you can't say what the cause is just based off this one image. Um, 
The most common cause of interstitial lung disease is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, but that requires you to know the patient's clinical history and things. So based off of this image alone, all you can say is this is interstitial lung disease. This is classic. You have the little like cysts at the, the periphery of the lung field. That's known as honeycombing. Okay. Um, the interstitium is thickened. So you've got, you can see all of these white lines. That's interstitial thickening. And that's because of the fibrotic process that's going on. Um, but in a nutshell, this is what interstitial lung disease or fibrosis looks like. And there's tons of causes which you need to know for your exams. Uh, someone's asked what ground glass appears like, so that's good. So can you see this stuff here is, is quite black. So black in lungs is normal because that's air. And then if you look over here, like you can see these sort of ground glass, like white, um, whitish bits of lung, and that's ground glass, okay? It's not, um, it's not black like it is over here. That's what ground glass is. All right, next question. So we're over halfway now. LTOT is long-term oxygen therapy. Good, this is a really important one for you to know. I'm glad none of you put smoking. What happens if you give L-TOT to a smoker? Yes, boom, very good. Uh, you don't wanna basically, it's a fire hazard, isn't it? If you have an oxygen tank and the patient's smoking, they could blow up, so you don't wanna do that. So smoking is, an, is a contraindication uh, to L-TOT. The indications are actually, this is just an excerpt from our textbook, but basically it's indicated if the PO2 is less than 7.3 or if the PO2 is between 7.3 and 8, and they have one of the following features of secondary polycythemia, peripheral edema, and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so this patient had a PO2 of 7.8 and they had peripheral edema, so they meet the criteria for LTOT. This is when you would consider assessing patients uh, for long-term oxygen therapy. And the way you assess them is you do an ABG a uh, couple of weeks apart on two separate occasions, and then you check that PO2. Good, diagnosis here. Bell's palsy, Bell's palsy, Bell's palsy. Uh, is it Bell's palsy? Yeah, good. It's a lower motor neuron 
facial nerve palsy, of which there are many causes, of which Bell's palsy is the most common. So that's the way you say it in your OSCEs, because, you know, how, um, how do you know this isn't a facial nerve palsy due to sarcoidosis or a facial nerve palsy due to Lyme's disease? And you don't really know, right? Uh, so it, 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 I, I was getting at Bell's palsy. This is why I, I wanted you to say none of the above. Um, so you're all very correct when you say Bell's palsy, but the best way to phrase it in OSCE is um, to like impress your examiners, say this, these examination findings are in keeping with a lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy. The most common cause of this is Bell's palsy. Uh, what are the other causes of a facial nerve palsy? Lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy. Ramsey Hunt, good. Yeah, it's a herpes zoster, Ramsey Hunt. Uh, Protic tumor, yeah, I suppose that would... Yep, definitely, parotid tumor. So Lyme's disease, sarcoidosis, um, those are the other ones that I remember. But well done, guys. So the reason you're not investigating this is because it's lower motor neuron, okay? If you are worried about a stroke, then you would scan the head with CT and MRI, but because it's a lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy, it's most likely Bell's palsy. You don't need to investigate any further. It's a clinical diagnosis. If a patient, and you'll see actually quite a few of these patients in A&E, um, there's a quite a classical presentation and uh, you don't need to investigate them with CT of the head if you're convinced it's a lower motor neuron uh, palsy. So someone's asked, don't you need to rule out stroke? You've ruled it out clinically, okay? They've got, when would you suspect a stroke? in these sorts of patients. Yeah, so if there's forehead sparing, okay, that's the key. Um, so if they've got facial weakness on one side, but they can, they can still raise their eyebrows and their forehead muscles are intact, that's very concerning for an upper motor neuron lesion, then you are worried about stroke. If they've got facial weakness plus they're slurring their speech or they've got arm weakness or leg weakness, then you're worried about a stroke. If they've got facial weakness and they've got forehead weakness and they can't close their eyes, that's very typical of a lower motor neuron lesion. You don't need to investigate them further, just follow them up and you can give them treatment for Bell's palsy, which is prednisolone if they present within a certain time frame. Okay, so this is a bit of a split here. Uh, so why is it, so for those of you who don't know, MCA is middle cerebral artery and ACA is anterior cerebral artery. So off the bat, we know it's right-sided because the patient has left-sided symptoms. Obviously everything in the brain happens on the other side. Um, it's not basilar artery because basilar artery strokes present with patients with reduced consciousness, their GCS is low, um, they're typically like literally GCS of less than eight, um, usually even GCS three. Okay, so these patients are very unwell. Why is it ACA versus MCA? So the leg is weaker than the arm, okay, and that's classic of anterior cerebral artery. So it's anterior cerebral because patient presents with a hemiparesis with the lower limb affected more than the upper limb. So uh, four out of five power of his left upper limb and three out of five power of his left lower limb. So his, limb, his leg is weaker than his arm. 
And if we go back to our neuroanatomy, this is broad, um, sorry, this is uh, the motor map called the homunculus. The central portion of the brain here controls leg movement and the outer portion controls arm, hands, face. The anterior cerebral artery supplies this bit here, okay? So it supplies this middle bit here. So if you lose your anterior cerebral artery, your leg is gonna be weaker than your arm. The middle cerebral artery supplies this outer bit here. So if you lose your middle cerebral artery, your arm will be weaker than your leg. So just knowing a bit of neuroanatomy there, but well done. Good. The answer is elentuzumab. So which of these is used as maintenance therapy in MS? So methylpred is used in a flare to when patient symptoms deteriorate. Plasma exchange is used in a flare. Oxybutynin is used for symptomatic control of bladder problems. And baclofen is used for symptomatic control of spasticity. Alemtuzumab is a monoclonal antibody and it's used in um, maintenance therapy. So long-term therapy, essentially. Um, other examples include, other examples of maintenance therapy include beta interferon, glatyramine acetate. Okay, so this was a bit of a tricky one again. Um, this is according to the NICE guidelines. If patients have CKD and diabetes, the target blood pressure is 130 over 80, okay? So my question to you is, if I have a patient with CKD and diabetes and their blood pressure is normal, should you start them on anything? Yeah, good. So you start them on an ACE inhibitor. Good. So CKD plus diabetes, doesn't matter what the blood pressure is, you always start them on an ACE inhibitor, so it doesn't matter, Ramipril, uh, and that's because it's renoprotective, okay? Um, good, yeah, and it helps with the proteinuria. But essentially, if someone's got CKD and diabetes, their target blood pressure is 130 over 80, this is different to the, you know, the demographic who don't have that combination of diseases where the target is 140 over 90. So this is your normal target here. But for patients with CKD and diabetes, you aim for 130 over 80. And 
to make things even a bit more confusing, 135 over 85, that's the diagnostic threshold to diagnose hypertension. If you give someone an ambulatory blood pressure monitor or a home blood pressure monitor. Hopefully that's all high yield. Good, next question. So in the final stretch now, I think this question is a bit annoying, but it's stuff they like to test in the exam, so I put it in here. Okay, so I, yeah, I, I always think these questions are really annoying because I can never remember, is it two months, is it two weeks, is it three months, is it, is it different for chlamydia, is it different for gonorrhea? Um, but here is a table taken from our textbook. And uh, essentially, if the, you need to think about things in these two sort of categories. So gonorrhea and chlamydia, you notify people slightly differently. Um, and you need to think, okay, is it a male with symptomatic urethritis or is it something else? In this case, it was a, um, I think the question was, it was a man with symptomatic urethritis and he had gonorrhea to so notify all sexual partners within the last two weeks. Okay, and that's why this is the answer. And the actual time period is slightly different, as I said, depending on whether it's gonorrhea or chlamydia or if it's a uh, male with symptomatic urethritis or not. So just learn this table, it's in the textbook and I put it here on the slides um, and you should be able to answer all of these types of questions on contact notification. Good. So the most common um, crystal arthropathy, arthropathy affecting the great toe is gout, as I'm sure you, you guys know. Gout presents with a swollen big toe or first metatarsal phalangeal joint. When you aspirate the joint and you look under polarized microscopy, you will see needle-shaped crystals with negative birefringence. The other one on this list to know about, rhomboid shaped crystals with positive birefringence and that's pseudogout. Pseudogout tends to affect um, bigger joints like the knee, shoulder, wrist.
for which of the following is not an identifiable disease. Well done, HIV is not notifiable. All of the other diseases on the list are notifiable diseases. Um, yeah, there's just something you need to learn and they like to ask questions like that in exams, uh, but just know that HIV is not notifiable. Uh, good, last two questions. So now the quicker you answer, the more points you get. So try and be quick. Good. What's the diagnosis? Itchy, scaly plaques on elbows. Psoriasis, very good. Um, first line management is it emollients and topical steroids and topical vitamin D. You give both of these things for a period of four weeks. So yeah, topical steroids and vitamin D are used once daily for four weeks, and that's why it's not topical steroid alone, it's not topical vitamin D alone. Methotrexate, that's used kind of third line if everything else fails. Phototherapy can be used second line if topical therapies fail. Okay, the final question. Uh, Again, the quicker you answer, the more points you get. Final question, best of luck. So this is the moment of truth. This is a difficult question, actually. Very good, very good. You all fell off my track. What, is Burkitt lymphoma a Hodgkin lymphoma? It's a non-Hodgkin lymphoma, okay? There are, four, there are a few types of Hodgkin lymphoma. The most common is nodular sclerosis, okay? Um, the less common ones are lymphocyte-rich, nodular lymphocyte-predominant, and mixed cellularity. Hematology is quite an annoying topic for students, and uh, I think um, it's one that you should learn properly with a good structure, and I've got some webinars on it, so please do check that out. Uh, I purposely made this question difficult because it was the last question, but the most common Hodgkin lymphoma associated with EBV is the mixed cellularity variant. Um, so well done if you got it right. No worries if you got it wrong because it was a difficult question, so don't stress. And in fact, a lot of these questions were pretty tricky, so don't stress if you know you didn't do as well as you hoped. Uh, mixed cellularity, yeah, that's good. Good. So I'm going to reveal the leaderboard. It's only going to have the top ten, so it's not going to show. You know, if you did badly, don't worry. It's not going to show your name. It's only going to show the top ten. If you came in the top three. Take a picture or a screenshot of the leaderboard and then um, email it to me at admin at bitemedicine.com and we will have 
your prizes sent to you. Well done everyone for taking part. Let me just um, reveal the leaderboard. Okay, and there we have it. Well done to the top three and to everyone who participated. Well done, Lim. Um, Hurry, Sammy, you came in the top three and every single one of you for participating because that was actually a really tricky quiz. And more than anything, I hope you learnt some new facts because that's the most important thing. Um, I'll stick around for a few minutes for any questions you have about the quiz or any medicine questions. Um, and let me give you the feedback form because that's always useful for us. So that's the QR code. Um, and you should be able to access the feedback form.